Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Rogers. I'm the co-founder and director of Planet Happiness. Uh, we're here today with a webinar for you uh, on the relationship between happiness and the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, by way of introduction to myself, I'm a tourism planner. I have spent the last 20 years advising destinations on how to develop tourism to maximize income and employment opportunities and deliver win-wins for local communities, uh, the environment, and the, the various stakeholders um, working in destinations, including the, the tourists and businesses. Um, uh, Planet Happiness offers an innovative approach to destination planning, and I look forward to explaining more to you about that in a, in a moment. Uh, next, I would like to introduce you to my co-founder colleague, Laura Musikansky. Hi, my name is Laura Musikansky. I am the Executive Director of the Happiness Alliance. I am a lawyer by training with a master's um, in business administration, and then two certificates, one-year programs, one on environmental law and regulation, and the other on environmental management. And that is my version of a triple bottom line education. And I see sustainability and happiness as flip sides of the same coin. And I see that the way that we are going to bring about sustainability in our lives, in our communities, in our, in our nations, is through the well-being of are in as, us as individuals of our communities and of our nations. So I'm excited to present to you today a bit about what the science is saying about the connections between sustainable development and happiness and well-being. But first, back to Paul to talk more about planet happiness. The topic of today with the SDGs and, and well-being is particularly important um, as many destinations, populations around the world at the moment are suffering very much with the, with the current crisis scenario that we have. And if we're going to overcome this scenario, one of the first things we need to focus on is the well-being of individuals. And through the approach that we take with this project, I hope you'll see as we work through how by focusing on individual well-being and community well-being, we can then help destinations to get back up on their, on their feet. Now, what, um, oop. sorry, I'm just having trouble. There we go, changing the, the slides. Now, Actually, let me let me hand back to Laura to explain to give you a little bit of an introduction to the to the Happiness Alliance first. So we'll talk a little bit about what the basis of the Happiness Alliance is, in that in, in the terms of that it's rooted in the happiness movement, which is which is um, a whole paradigm shift going from an economic system that's based on economic growth and profit and personal wealth to a system, a whole economic and social system that's based on happiness and well-being, which is really the purpose of life and the purpose of our economy. So the Happiness Alliance is one small piece in this big, huge puzzle of everything that's happening to create this shift at a global level and also at a national level. So we've been providing the happiness index based, based on Bhutan's Gross National Happiness Index that anybody can use and people all over the world have used it as individuals and also to measure the happiness and well-being of their groups. So I would encourage you at this point to go to happycounts.org or to go to our heritage, our happiness.org at the Planet Happiness website and have a personal experience of what do we mean by happiness and well-being and you will see your own assessment of that and this is something that more and more governments are starting to see as important and are, they are starting to see of how they could actually implement your the measurement of your happiness to change policies so that's a little bit of the big view of what's happening in terms of a transformation of our systems back to you paul great thanks laura then a quick recap into the happiness agenda and the purpose of planet happiness. Now, if tourism is a vehicle for development, how do we engage host communities to strengthen their individual happiness and collective well-being? 
So we focused here on two issues, uh, inclusive destination planning for responsible tourism and to avoid over-tourism. And to take this agenda forward, we're uh, building synergies with the wider uh, growing global interest in the happiness and well-being agenda. The key element of our approach is to deploy the happiness index survey, which takes around 15 minutes to complete online. It's available at the moment in around 24 languages and, and growing. So 15 minutes, you answer a series of questions, and at the end, you have your one-page scorecard comparing your personal happiness score with everybody else that has taken the survey. We cover 11 domains in that uh, survey, plus there are questions about tourism to understand whether or not the host community uh, understand what their response is to the level of tourism, the extent to which tourism is benefiting uh, local households. Um, the approach is quite innovative in the sense that if you're putting together a destination management plan, it's very typical to engage the government stakeholders, the private sector stakeholders, but reaching out to the community is not something that is typically done. And we have an approach that allows that to happen by deploying the survey and then engaging with different stakeholder groups to present the results and seek suggestions from them. So just as you get a one-page individual scorecard, you have a one-page scorecard on the left for a destination that compares the score of the host community with all other survey takers. And on the right, if we take away that comparison with everybody else, it allows us to determine where the community is, is strongest with their domains and where their deficiencies are. We can then focus on those deficiencies, ask questions of the host community on what they think should be implemented to strengthen those deficient schools. Now, that's a, a quick recap on what we, uh, what we did last week. And now uh, we move on to happiness and sustainability, the interconnections and I'll hand you back to Laura. Okay, thank you, Paul. Intuitively, you already know that happiness and sustainability are deeply intertwined. If you look at the sustainability in terms of the economy, in terms of the environment, in terms of society, you know that when you are living in a world where you can depend upon your needs being met, you are going to be happy. But that is not something that we have built into our economic system today. Today, when we think about happiness in our economic system, we think that we're gonna be happier when we have more money. Right now, we're in the middle of a crisis where we see that no matter how much money you have, when you're faced with a huge threat to your own well-being and to the well-being and the health of the people that you love, how much money you have doesn't matter, that it really is about looking at things from a different perspective. So that we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Some of the sciences that's coming up now is saying that yes, indeed, people's happiness and well-being are very much connected to sustainable development upon many different levels. One of the main well ways that sustainable development is defined is what, well, I'll say that it was through the Brundtland Commission, Our Common Future, which, which looks at sustainability broadly and very, very, has a lot of overlap with how we're defining happiness and well being. We talked about in a lot, that in the last presentation. But here now, currently, we are defining sustainable development in terms of what's called the Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs. In 2020, the, um, the World Happiness Report was issued, and in it was a chapter looking at what is the relationship between people's happiness and well-being and the, and the achievement of the sustainable development goals? And it found, as you probably can all intuitively figure out, that countries that are reaching sustainable development at higher levels have, in those countries, people are generally happier. And this is important, an important concept because what this says is that we can achieve sustainability, sustainable development through the paradigm of happiness and well being, and vice versa. We can achieve happiness and well being 
through the paradigm of sustainable development. There are different possibilities that we can look into and figure out how are we going to manage our lives, our communities, our nations, and our world for the future. Let's go to the next slide, Paul. All right, so what are those goals? So there are 17 different goals and um, the, first, the first goals mostly have to do with things that we would call in the terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, basic needs, sustenance needs. So those, those goals of um, poverty, of um, equality, of hunger, these kinds of things. Let me re restate that. So the first goal is of, of no poverty, the second goal is of hunger, the third goal is of health, and the fourth of education. And then we go on, we have goals around the, um, around the environment and around our economy. Here, this is a really important graphic because what this tells you is which goals contribute to well-being the most. And of course, this varies based on country, but what this is telling you, that when you look at this, you'll see that goal number three, health, accounts for about 24% of happiness and well-being. And this makes a lot of sense right now when we're facing this terrible threat to the global health. But you'll also notice that about 20% our social goals, so that's goal one is for no poverty, goal five is for um, gender equality, and then goal 10 is for reduced inequalities. And that's a big portion of our happiness and well-being. And then 31% is economic. But if you were to combine health and social, it would outdo the economic goals. So mentioned earlier that we live in a paradigm where we say that the more money you have, the happier you're going to be. But we also live in a world where we are, have resource constraints and growing resource constraints and growing threats. So what we can think about when we think about these relationships between what, how we bring about sustainable development and how we bring about our happiness and well-being is how can we maximize those sustainable development goals to bring about sustainable development and happiness in a resource constrained world and that's something that i think is does very well for us to think about and talk about which brings us to one other point that i think this slide is important which is saying that the environment doesn't have a lot to do, the meeting environmental goals doesn't have a lot to do with our happiness and well being. And what I'd suggest to you is that that is because we are thinking and working in a paradigm where we do not value the environment sufficiently. And that once we get to the point where we have threats to our well-being and our happiness based on the environment, just like we have threats to our well-being and our happiness based on health, we will value the environment much, much more greatly. And that portion that's only 8% right now will grow and that portion that's the economy will, will get much smaller. Let's not get to that point. And that's up to us to do something about the way that we think about the environment, we already know that in terms of our happiness and well-being and in terms of sustainable development. Let's go to the next slide, Paul. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about one nation that is actually using the lens of happiness and well-being to meet the sustainable development goals. And that's in Indonesia, where the Department of Planning is finding ways to measure and then manage happiness and well-being in order to meet the sustainable development goals. And this is important work and an important, an important shift in the paradigm because they understand that if they go for economic growth, for merely economic growth, they will break the back of their environment 
and perhaps even their people. So I'd encourage you, there's a, a link there to watch this video that the, um, that the minister of the planning department talks about this shift that they're actually enacting in Indonesia. So we'll go ahead to the next slide, Paul. Here I wanted to show you a little bit, just briefly, we already talked about the Sustainable Development Goals, but the Sustainable Development Goals have indicators for each goal. And this gives you an, a little bit of an idea of how many indicators there are. There are a lot for all 17 different goals. And there's overlap in some of those indicators. One of the important things to note about the Sustainable Development Goal indicators is that they are predominantly objective. So what does that mean? An objective indicator measures something that you can see, that you can count. So for the most part, they're going to measure, for example, um, the greenhouse gas emissions with regards to climate change. They will measure um, the poverty rates with, re with regards to poverty. So go to the next slide, please, Paul. And what happiness and well-being indicators do is they predominantly use what are called, it's an unfortunate term, subjective, but we should call them survey-based or poll-based indicators. And so these are questions that are asking, what is your perception? How do you feel about things? Now this may seem, this is one of the pro problems with the word subjective, this may seem like something that doesn't matter, but the fact is, is that how you feel about something is the reason that you do everything in life. You don't do it because greenhouse gas emissions are going up or down. You do it because you feel like it's important, or you do it because you don't want to have the pain, or you want to have the pleasure, or you're seeking peace, or you're everything that we do is because of how we feel. And so these measures that we, that are scientifically valid, the happiness index has scientifically valid measures. There's a whole bank of research and lots of resources. You can go to happycounts.org and go to the community toolkit and have access to many of these that say, yes, indeed, we can measure happiness. It has been measured and these measurements are valid. They give us really good data. So that's a little bit about in sustainability, we're using predominantly objective indicators and in happiness, we're using predominantly subjective indicators. I said at the beginning of this presentation that I see sustainability and happiness as flip sides of the same coin. And I think that it's really important that we have both the subjective and the objective so that we can get a holistic and a complete picture of what's happening in our lives and in our circumstances. We'll go to the next slide, please, Paul. This is a, just a conceptual uh, image for you to see some of the ways of thinking about happiness and well being and sustainable development and what are some of the overlaps and what are some of the gaps. Um, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. We did some analysis to look at what are some of the what are some of the um, missing indicators in terms of the sustainable development goals? We'll go to the next slide and we'll look at those indicators. So we find that, you remember the slide where you saw all that panoply of um, sustainable development goal indicators? Well, these are some of the indicators in well-being indices. We looked at a variation of different well-being indices and said, what's missing in the sustainable development goal indicators. And so if you were, if you right now were the minister or were um, working to measure and achieve sustainable development in your nation or in your region, these would be the indicators that you could use coming out of well-being indices to complement what's happening in sustainable development goal. And so later you could come back to this and sort of contemplate um, how what, does this make a difference to you? Do these indicators make a difference in terms of um, how you're living your life? Do they reflect what's important to you? And I'd encourage you to, to do that same thing by taking the happiness index. We'll go to the next slide. All right. So um, we'll hand it back to Paul here, but this is, um, this is telling you what the point of using well-being and happiness indices is and why it's so important in this shift of this paradigm from going to money matters most 
to going to your happiness and well-being matter the most. Great. Thanks very much, Laura. As you can all see, Laura's uh, expertise in this area is, is considerable. Um, and uh, I'd also like to point you towards the quarterly reports that she produces from the, the data that's harvested from people taking the survey. These reports are available on the homepage of the Happiness Alliance uh, website, and they're colorful and engaging, uh, geared towards engaging the, the host communities that we're, we're working with. Um, so why I'm enthused about this project is because it takes us, um, it, it takes us into a realm where people's intuitive uh, thoughts around happiness and well-being are extended. People can learn more about them and put it provides a platform to help shape conversation and conversations between different stakeholders on what our individual needs are and what our needs are as, as communities. So it introduces and explains what is meant by individual and community well-being. It may be over time that the questions in the survey are adapted, uh, changed as a result of uh, new knowledge that, that comes uh, together but it, it sparks conversations and engages people in this dialogue about happiness, well-being, quality of life, uh, which up to this point has been somewhat ignored in, um, in political discourse. So by deploying uh, the data uh, at, at, in a baseline situation, it allows us to measure and illustrate uh, where individuals and communities strengths are and where they they are vulnerable and and starts conversations about what interventions are needed to to strengthen the collective happiness of the of the destination community and it allows for an interventions to be designed and to be implemented and then it allows for further iterations of the of the survey to engage more people in the conversation about what is going to benefit us as individuals and, and communities and what does tourism need to be doing to develop in a more responsible manner that is going to strengthen the collective well-being of the host community. And that might be ways to provide job opportunities, new job opportunities to host communities in terms of product development. It might be related to that might be related to tangible or intangible heritage, for, for example, um, developing new excursions, uh, interpreting local art, uh, whatever it might be that the community is involved in. It doesn't have to be a purely tourism related uh, intervention. It might be uh, related to the needs of communities to have areas for, for children to, to play, to recreate. Um, it might be related to providing um, uh, learning opportunities uh, after, I mean, adult education uh, classes in a particular area. It really depends on what the community feel is needed in their situation. But I'm as sure as as I can be, that by the stakeholders working together and harnessing the interests of tourism-related business and discerning visitors to destinations, that collectively these needs can be, can be met. So over time, it allows us to compare and, and contrast uh, the results that are coming forward from different destinations to come up with solutions to more responsible tourism planning. Um, so this will, will help engage people, not just in tourism planning, but also in, in wider uh, policy discussions about uh, screening tools that are used for government budgets to allocate uh, government spending to support the well-being of, of host communities. And as you've seen from the, uh, from the presentation to today, it, it, we can link uh, the happiness agenda to attainment of the of the well-being the sustainable development sorry the sustainable development goals um, and and it can link these two agendas and facilitate a collective movement towards the attainment of the of the SDGs um, and at the very bottom there you see a, a quote from the chief economist of the World Bank recognizing that GDP is something that we should leave in the past 
and today we should be focusing on what well-being means and strengthening and moving towards well-being. Um, so uh, I think that brings us to the end of the end of the presentation. Uh, I'll hand back over to Laura to see if you have any final comments to, to add there, Laura. No, I think that's great, Paul. And what I'd really encourage people to do is to really think about what matters in their lives. And what, where do you want, um, what direction do you want your life to go? And what direction do you want your community to go? Because we are at a crossroads, as we will always be. And we, do, we can make a difference. So I'm really grateful to be working with Paul and hope to be working with you in the future in Planet Happiness. So thank you. Great. Thank, thanks, Laura. Uh, we have one more presentation in this series to, uh, to give to you next, uh, next week. We look forward to, to that. Um, and just as a parting thought, you know, I wonder how long it will take us to get back up from this current crisis that is affecting us. How long will it take the international uh, tourism market to re-establish itself in some shape or form? Uh, we've heard many people arguing already um, for greater equity and benefits to be shared with host communities. And I hope you agree that what we have here is a process that can facilitate and, and enable uh, greater appreciation of what local needs are and, and how to, to meet them. And lastly, whilst it might take some time for the international tourism uh, market to re-establish itself, all the time uh, we're waiting for that to, to happen in whatever shape or form it may take, domestic tourism uh, will grow uh, and return more quickly. And this, this approach that we have is also something that is appropriate for, for us to consider when supporting uh, destinations that receive high numbers of, of domestic tourists. So uh, with that, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you with any questions um, and hopefully working with you in the future. Thank you. <laughs>